Well, summer in Minnesota is almost here. We are at uh, June 8th, 2017, and we're supposed to get near possibly over 100 degrees this weekend. Is this global warming? Welcome to North Star Oasis, everybody. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another hour of your favorite public affairs programming. We're going to start today by taking a look at something that Donald Trump did, President Trump, on the first of the month. He pulled us out of the Paris Climate Accord. Now, we've already covered a lot of the intricacies of that particular issue, but we're going to play about a minute clip here just as a reminder to get you into today's show. I am fighting every day for the great people of this country. Therefore, in order to fulfill my solemn duty to protect America and its citizens, the United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord, but begin negotiations to re-enter either the Paris Accord or in really entirely new transaction on terms that are fair to the United States, its businesses, its workers, its people, its taxpayers. So we're getting out, but we will start to negotiate and we will see if we can make a deal that's fair. And if we can, that's great. And if we can't, that's fine. Now, ever since President Trump did that at the first of the month, there has been nothing, nothing but criticism. Criticism coming from German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Criticism coming from former President Barack Obama, former Vice President Al Gore, actor Leonardo DiCaprio, and so many other college campus activists, college professors, and everybody who believes the global warming climate change hype that are not scientists. So the question is, is pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement going to bring on monumental catastrophe across the planet? Or are we going to go back to business as usual? Well, let's take a look at what scientists have to say about climate change. Here's our Prager I'm University an atmospheric physicist. Today. I've published more than 200 scientific papers. For 30 years, I taught at MIT, during which time the climate has changed remarkably little. But the cry of global warming has grown ever more shrill. In fact, it seems that the less the climate changes, the louder the voices of the climate alarmists get. So let's clear the air and create a more accurate picture of where we really stand on the issue of global warming, or as it is now called, climate change. There are basically three groups of people dealing with this issue. Groups one and two are scientists. Group three consists mostly at its core of politicians, environmentalists, and media. Group one is associated with the scientific part of the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, working group one. These are scientists who mostly believe that recent climate change is primarily due to man's burning of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. This releases CO2, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere, and they believe this might eventually dangerously heat the planet. Group two is made up of scientists who don't see this as an especially serious problem. It's the group I belong to. We're usually referred to as skeptics. We note that there are many reasons why the climate changes, the sun, clouds, oceans, the orbital variations of the Earth, as well as a myriad of other inputs. None of these is fully understood, and there is no evidence that CO2 emissions are the dominant factor. But actually, there is much agreement between both groups of scientists. The following are such points of agreement. One, the climate is always changing. Two, 
CO2 is a greenhouse gas without which life on Earth is not possible, but adding it to the atmosphere should lead to some warming. Three, atmospheric levels of CO2 have been increasing since the end of the Little Ice Age in the 19th century. Four, over this period, past two centuries, the global mean temperature has increased slightly and erratically by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree Celsius. But only since the 1960s have man's greenhouse emissions been sufficient to play a role. Five, given the complexity of climate, no confident prediction about future global mean temperature or its impact can be made. The IPCC acknowledged in its own 2007 report that, quote, the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible, end quote. Most importantly, the scenario that the burning of fossil fuels leads to catastrophe isn't part of what either group asserts. So why are so many people worried, indeed panic-stricken, about this issue? Here's where group three comes in, the politicians, environmentalists, and media. Global warming alarmism provides them, more than any other issue, with the things they most want. For politicians, it's money and power. For environmentalists, it's money for their organizations and confirmation of their near religious devotion to the idea that man is a destructive force acting upon nature. And for the media, it's ideology, money, and headlines. Doomsday scenarios sell. Meanwhile, over the last decade, scientists outside of climate physics have jumped on the bandwagon, publishing papers blaming global warming for everything from acne to the Syrian civil war. And crony capitalists have eagerly grabbed for the subsidies that governments have so lavishly provided. Unfortunately, Group 3 is winning the argument because they have drowned out the serious debate that should be going on. But while politicians, environmentalists, and media types can waste a lot of money and scare a lot of people, they won't be able to bury the truth. The climate will have the final word on that. I'm Richard Lindzen, Emeritus Professor of Atmospheric Sciences at MIT for Prager University. So there you have it. There are three groups of people who discuss climate the IPCC, other scientists, and then other. And we're going to actually talk more about two of those three groups today. We're not going to really get into the IPCC that much, but we're going to start with the other category. Media, actors, politicians, the other, the hype. We're not going to talk about Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, 1972, I was a year old, and at that point in time, there was a big fear we were going into an ice age. As a matter of fact, here's Walter Cronkite from 1972. Professor Hubert Lamb says that a new ice age is creeping over the northern hemisphere. Even then, it won't be as bad as the last ice age 60,000 years ago. Then New York, Cincinnati, St. Louis were under 5,000 feet of ice. Presumably no traffic moved and school was let out for the day. And that's the way it is, Monday, September 11th, 1972. She has helped me from day one. So that was the first clip we wanted to play. Walter Cronkite talking about an ice age and cooling, 1972. 1977, Time Magazine featured a glacier on their front cover, fearing an ice age. I think back in 1975, Greenpeace was out trying with, um, with hair dryers trying to melt glaciers and icebergs. I've seen the photographs. This was what life was like 40 years ago. We were not concerned about warming. We were concerned about cooling. That was what the media consensus was all about when it came to the environment and environmental catastrophe. And it didn't stop, except in the 1980s, things started to change. 1988, 
Ted Danson. Remember him as Sam Malone on the TV series Cheers? Well, he proclaimed in 1988 that we only have 10 years to save the oceans. That's what he said, 10 years. Well, we're coming upon the 20th, or 88, 98, 08, 18, the 30th anniversary of his predictions. So that would have been 20 years ago. By uh, 1998, the oceans should have killed us all. That was Ted Danson. Believes strongly in climate change. And 30 years later, he's still preaching that tune. Here is Ted Danson when he was stumping for Hillary Clinton during last year's election. She has helped me from day one. She, no, she, she has been on to climate change, global warming, since it first you know, came to the world's attention. She's been working with world leaders on this. She is somebody who can use her connections and her power from day one, as opposed to somebody who really thinks that it's not real, that it's a hoax. That is something, while we're dealing with our everyday lives, with our problems that are very real, very real, at the same time, over here is climate change. And it's a huge, huge, big deal. So you need somebody who can multitask, like Hillary can, yes, to take can. care of all those things in our everyday lives, at the same time dealing with something so huge as climate change. So, we're hearing from an actor who has already been proven wrong 20 years ago for his prediction, and the actor continues to soak up press over a model that is incorrect and a prediction that hasn't happened. I'm surprised people still take him seriously. I quit taking him seriously in 1988. I used to love Cheers. I thought Sam Malone was an awesome character, and if I were going to be a character in a TV show, you know, Sam Malone was pretty cool. Kind of like Sam Malone. Hey, he was a baseball player, too. He was a pitcher. I don't think he was any good, but the Sam Malone, as a character, his pitching was just as bad as Ted Danson, the actor's predictions on the climate. They were pretty bad. But then again, Ted Danson is always pretending to be somebody else. In this case, he's pretending to be a scientist, which he is not. Um, so that again comes out of group three, Ted Danson. I still don't believe that people give him, and I know I'm talking about him, but not, not looking up and kissing his rear end, like I, you know that clip you just saw. The uh, fact is, he's a nobody. He's a nobody about as much as I'm a nobody. Uh, but yet people still, oh, he's an actor, got to Google all over him. Uh, but the fact is, on the climate, he's still wrong. So now, the most famous member of group number three, the media, the politicians, the entertainers, comes Al Gore, the former vice president, who really put global warming and climate change on the map. The Arctic ice cap, which for most of the last three million years has been the size of the lower 48 states, has shrunk by 40 percent. But this understates the seriousness of this particular problem because it doesn't show the thickness of the ice. The Arctic ice cap is, in a sense, uh, the beating heart of the global climate system. It expands in winter and contracts in summer. The next slide I show you will be a rapid fast forward of what's happened over the last 25 years. The permanent ice is marked in red. And as you see, it expands to the dark blue. That's the annual ice in winter, and it contracts in summer. And the so-called permanent ice, five years old or older, you can see it's almost like blood spilling out of the body here. In 25 years, it's gone from this to this. This is a problem because the warming heats up the frozen ground around the Arctic Ocean, where there is a massive amount of frozen carbon, which, when it thaws, is turned into methane by microbes. Compared to the total amount of global warming pollution in the atmosphere, that amount could double if we cross this tipping point. Already in some shallow lakes in Alaska, methane is actively bubbling up out of the water. Professor Katie 
Walter from the University of Alaska went out with another team to another shallow lake last winter. She's okay. The question is whether we will be. And one reason is this enormous heat sink heats up Greenland from the north. This is an annual melting river, but the volumes are much larger than ever. This is the Kangerlussig River in southwest Greenland. If you want to know how sea level rises from land-based ice melting, this is where it reaches the sea. These flows are increasing very rapidly. At the other end of the planet, Antarctica, the largest mass of ice on the planet. Last month, scientists reported the entire continent is now in negative ice balance, and West Antarctica, propped up on tops of undersea islands, is particularly rapid in its melting. That's equal to 20 feet of sea level, as is Greenland. In the Himalayas, the third largest mass of ice, at the top you see new lakes, which a few years ago were glaciers. 40% of all the people in the world get half of their drinking water from that melting flow. In the Andes, this glacier is the source of drinking water for this city. The flows have increased, but when they go away, so does much of the drinking water. In California, there's been a 40% decline in the Sierra snowpack. This is hitting the reservoirs, and the predictions, as you've read, are serious. This drying around the world has led to a dramatic increase in fires, and the disasters around the world have been increasing at an absolutely extraordinary and unprecedented rate, four times as many in the last 30 years as in the previous 75. This is a completely unsustainable pattern. And so, according to NASA, I was trying to pull up an article in Forbes magazine, but according to, uh, from October 27, 2016 in Forbes magazine, the Antarctic ice sheet is growing. Now, of course, they're saying, oh, it doesn't mean that global warming isn't real. Al Gore just said, and then, by the way, that TED Talk was prior to 2012, so we're not looking at, at new things. I wanted to show back in history what Al Gore was saying. He's saying that the ice sheet in Antarctica is decreasing, therefore, we have a problem. Well, we, as of eight months ago, the ice sheet was still growing in record volume. What's the problem? So now here, the ice sheet in Antarctica shrinks. It's a problem, according to Al Gore. Now, according to, um, I think it's uh, Eric Corpella, we have a record Antarctic ice sheet, and it's a global warming problem. This is a case of trying to have their cake and eat it too. That's the way they operate. Now, um, again, oh, and his disclaimer, Eric Corpola. Disclaimer, I am not a climate scientist, but I can do math. It's a dangerous skill to have. I'm not a climate scientist, but I can point out hypocrisy. Uh, according to you know, his story here, and I have not read this yet, uh, but what he does say is projecting a linear trend, Arctic summer sea ice has decreased about 30% or uh, 3 by 10 to the 6 kilometer square since 1980. In the same period, Antarctic summer sea ice has increased by about 4% or about 0.7 times 10 to, uh, 10 to the 6th uh, kilometer squared. The first thing you should notice is that it isn't an equal and opposite trend. Huh? The fact is, is the ice sheet growing or is it shrinking? It happens. And just as Al Gore had shown with the Arctic, where it melts and then it expands and it melts and expands. Same thing happens in Antarctica. It melts and expands. It melts and expands. That's part of breathing, which Al Gore did actually get right. And yet we take these people seriously so much. Wildfires. I'm a former wildland firefighter. Part of my training was to study forest management. And I'll tell you this, our forests are not being properly managed. That's half of our problem in all of these big, large wildfires. Look at the one last year in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, outside of the National Forest that pretty much leveled Gatlinburg. 
That town, I don't even, you know, I don't know how they've rebuilt. I haven't looked into it since it happened last year. But the fact is that was a massive wildfire. But they haven't been managing the forests properly. And we'll have another show on forest management and, and how that actually impacts more of a local climate. Look at Minnesota. You notice that we just got through a cold and wet, rainy spring and then automatically jump into 90 to 80, 90 degree temperatures. It seems that our fall and our springs are getting colder and wetter. Our winter, we have snowpack. So maybe, what, eight, nine months out of the year, we get precipitation. And then all of a sudden, we get three months of summer, and then we go back into that nine-month period. But look at how many trees we have planted. You know, there was a survey done, um, I, I'm still trying to find the documentation, but there has been a, uh, a survey done back in the 1800s showing the trees and, um, in, in Minnesota. So about 120, 140, 50 years ago, uh, if I'm remembering the dates correct from when I had last seen the data. There were not that many hardwoods, at least in the St. Paul area, north of Roselawn Avenue in Maplewood. The 45th parallel, we did not have that many trees a hundred and something years ago. It what do we have now? We yeah, have way too many trees for what we had back then. And trees do happen to attract rain. Why are we getting all of this rain? Why is it wet? Why is it so gloomy? Why is it so cold? It may actually be because we planted so many trees. But we'll get into that another time. But here we put guys like Al Gore on the pedestal, but their predictions don't hold true. That's group three. Guys like Ted Danson, it's group three. Walter Cronkite, I will give deference to Walter Cronkite. He was just doing his job as an anchorman, reporting on what somebody had written for his teleprompter. But still, CBS News has to run the story. Oh, it's global cooling. But none of these guys are scientists. And yes, I've been wanting to say this for quite a long time. So if I sound like I'm venting, it's because I actually am. Because I've heard this for my entire life. The sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. But yet, I wake up the next day. We're still here. It's not a catastrophe. I wake up the day after. I'm still here. It's still not a catastrophe. But yet, we take these guys way too seriously. Now, I'm going to change the scope of the discussion now because these are the people that we need to take seriously and actually have a serious intellectual discussion, not a one-way monologue. And thankfully, I can actually give the one-way monologue this time. Um, but I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Judith Curry. 1982 to 1986, well, first of all, 1974, she got her uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Geography, cum laude, from Northern Illinois University. 1982, she obtained her Ph.D. from the University of Chicago in Geophysical Sciences. 1982 to 1986, she was an assistant science, scientist, Department of Meteorology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 86 to 89, assistant professor in Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences from Purdue University. 1989 to 1992, associate professor, Department of Meteorology from Penn State. 1992 to 2002, professor of the University of Colorado Boulder, Department of Aerospace Engineering Sciences, Program in Atmospheric and Oceanic Science, Environmental Studies Program. 2002 to 2014, Chair of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, Georgia Institute of Technology. 2002 to present professor, School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, University Institute of Technology. That is Dr. Judith Curry. You want to talk to somebody who knows about the climate and the climate science and the climate models? This is one of your people. And we're going to hear from her right now. And so forth. Um, climate models were originally developed, the, the sort of the kind that we see now, were developed um, 
around you know 1970 at that time and they were designed to test our understanding of how we get the circulation patterns right could we produce the general climatological features and scientists started testing the climate sensitivity to increasing carbon dioxide what happens if we increase the output from the sun and playing various games like that just to test the sensitivity of the models. And so these climate models were tremendously useful tools because they were able to, you could use them to conduct numerical experiments in ways that you couldn't do empirically with the real climate system. Okay, and we learned a lot from, you know, these global climate models. And they, you know, over the decades, they grew in complexity. Notably, they added chemistry in terms of atmospheric chemistry and ocean geochemistry related to air pollution, the carbon cycle, and things like that. Um, sea ice models and land surface models got more sophisticated they reduced the horizontal resolution, and so the idea was that, you know, the model should become increasingly closer to the truth in terms of simulation. Model of the 23rd century, based on a, a process like this, and for, again, from my layman's perspective, I see several layers of fuzziness going on here. For example, the resolution of these models, um, which I understand to be something that's somewhat limited by the computer processing power itself, um, that the increasing resolution requires exponentially greater uh, processing power. Um, but also things like the parameterize parameterizations, which is a difficult word to articulate, and the physical laws themselves that are at play here. So let's, let's take a, a, a step back from this and say, okay, well, instead of looking forward, surely these models would be useful for uh, looking backwards. If these are good models, then we can take a starting point from in the past and run them forward to our present time and see how they compare to the, uh, the actual uh, temperature record. And I understand this is something that does take place, hind casting, as it's called. And in your report, you uh, quote a recent article in Science uh, entitled, Climate Scientists Open Up Their Black Boxes to Scrutiny. And you quote, Indeed, whether climate scientists like to admit it or not, nearly every model has been calibrated precisely to the 20th century climate records. Otherwise, it would have ended up in the trash. So, so what does this mean? What does this calibration or tuning of these models to the actual data uh, mean? And what does that tell us about their reliability? Okay. Models do need to be calibrated, so there's nothing wrong per se with this. The problem is when it's that, that there's explicit and implicit calibration. The explicit calibration is when you tune one of these parameters, okay, to a value that you think will give you the right answer. The implicit one is when you may have like a hundred and hundred different choices and you've run the models with all these different choices and then the you pick the one that matches your preconceived notions of what the outcome should look like. Um, in the IPCC fourth assessment it was rather astonishing that all the um, the models agreed very well with the 20th century observed record. But then when you go into the 21st century, they diverge greatly. So then you ask, well, how did they agree in the 20th? <laughs> so, so basically, they all, you know, calibrated it in different ways, but ended up getting the answer. And then when you integrate that forward into the 20th century, 21st century, you get pretty different results. Right. So just to make that so, explicit, there are many different models that could capture that data from the 20th century, but that doesn't mean that they are correct models and thus will not give us a correct prediction. Dr. Curry, are you there? Those same simulations are used to determine how much of the recent warming was human-caused versus natural. 
variability. And, and so <laughs> because they don't get the phasing of the big ocean oscillations and circulations correct, any warming from the ocean oscillations is sort of implicitly inferred to be from carbon dioxide and human causes. So you end up, you know, with that convolution in the 20th century simulation. So we're left without really knowing or understanding what's caused the warming in the 20th century. Um, no one questions that humans have contributed something, but exactly how much we don't know, because it, it, it's a very convoluted, complex, nonlinear system. It's very hard to separate those things out, and we've been using the climate models, but the climate models have been calibrated and tuned in this unfortunate way, and so we're left, you know, without an objective way to separate that out and it may fundamentally be an ill, Ill posed problem trying to figure out how to separate those that essentially is the crux of the argument the climate models and just to reiterate she said you, you know you can have a hundred different choices and what they're doing is picking one that matches their preconceived notions of what it should look like let me give you a metaphor. Now, I know there are a lot of people who don't like metaphors, don't understand them, and want to read too much into them. But it's like coming from the Twin Cities and having to take a trip by car or any other ground transportation to Dallas, Texas. What route do you choose? Now, of course, the one that's probably the most accurate as far as getting you there on time and in the fewest amount of miles would be taking Interstate 35 from the Twin Cities all the way down to Dallas, and then there it is, you're in Dallas. You don't have to go on any other different roadway. That's one choice out of these climate models. That's the, probably the most accurate model. But you can also go up to Duluth and cut across on US 2, take that over to Seattle, then go down to LA, you can take Highway 10 back into Texas, and then from Highway 10 come up from Houston, I believe, over to um, Dallas. I don't think 10 runs into Dallas. It's a roundabout way, but you'll still get to your destination. You can take 169, at least through uh, Kansas, probably into Oklahoma, and then from there cut across. There are probably about a thousand different routes that you can take to get from the Twin Cities to Dallas, Texas. That's your choices. You're not limited to that one choice, but that's the way the climate models are. You have a whole plethora of choices but the ones that are the most accurate are the ones that are going to get you from here to there with as little deviation as possible, like driving from here to Dallas on Interstate 35. That's, like I say, the most accurate choice. Now, of course, looking at a linear map, it's easier to just say, oh, well, we're going to take this route. When you're looking into the future, of course, there's the, the, there's the unknown factor. And you don't know if you have all of the data at play. So I understand that it's a lot more convoluted than just going from here to uh, Dallas, Texas by car or bus or horse. But the fact is, with all of these choices, they're not all accurate. And if your hypothesis is off, it's going to steer you in the wrong direction. And that is what's happening with the IPCC. And that's what's happening with people like Al Gore. They're going off in the wrong direction because they have a different purpose in going off in those directions. Now, that reminds me, we're going to take a look at the differences between certain scientists and other scientists because there's not, you know, this again, going back to the earlier uh, video, we've got group one and group two all in the scientific community and then you have the others. Well, we've already talked enough about the others, but let's go back to group one and group two. Here's John Stossel. Climate changes, always has, always will. It changed before man. Is man causing it now? Is global warming a crisis? And can we do anything about it? Those are the big questions. So let's have a debate about that. Roy Spencer is a climatologist at the University of Alabama. He's skeptical about man causing global warming. Uh, to debate him, we have 
Well, actually, we have an empty chair. We ask a dozen scientists who are concerned about man causing global warming to debate Roy. Most refuse. The Union of Concerned Scientists says that debating you, Roy, would be doing the public a disservice because it would give your extreme ideas credibility. So what do you say to that? It's, it's how you're portrayed as this wacky extremist. Well, as you've already mentioned, John, I, I don't deny that there's been warming. In fact, I don't even deny that some of the warming uh, is due to mankind. What I deny is that we have any clue how much of the warming, whether it's 10% or 90%, I don't think we have a clue. All right, so before we hear from you, I want to hear from both sides on this issue. So we did find a scientist who was alarmed about man causing global warming, who was willing to talk about this as long as it was not a debate. So, Roy, get lost. Go away if you would take a seat over there, and let's welcome NASA scientist Gavin Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt, come on in. You work for the Goddard... I work for NASA. the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, uh, which is a NASA offshoot in New York City. All right, so why is Roy Spencer wrong in saying we're not sure about man causing it? So you made a good point earlier on. You said that climate changes all the time. It has, and it has done for many, many different reasons. It's changed because we've had big volcanoes. It's changed because the sun has changed. It's changed because there have been orbital wobbles uh, in the Earth's path around the sun that has caused like, ice ages to come and go. All of those things are totally true. So we've looked, we've looked at the sun, it's not the sun. We've looked at volcanoes, it's not volcanoes. We've looked at the orbit, it's not, it's not the orbit. This time it's not those right. things. Uh, but what we've been doing the last 150 years, we've been increasing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, over 40% in terms of carbon dioxide. We've more than doubled the amount of methane, which is another greenhouse gas. And the signatures of those changes are very, very clear all the way through the system. Assuming this is true, why is it necessarily a problem? Warmer might be better. More people die from cold than warmth. We have built a society and an agricultural system and cities and everything that we do based on assumptions that basically the climate is not going to change. The fact that we have so much uh, infrastructure right near the shore is, is because we didn't expect the sea level to rise. The damage that we had from Hurricane Sandy was increased because sea level has increased by you know, 10 to 12 inches in this right. area. President uh, Obama over, over says wildfires are increasing, hurricanes are increasing, drought. Is this true? I, I thought these things have always happened, and this is alarmism. You agree with that? So there are some things that we can look at and we can say, okay, they're changing. Heat waves. Uh, we're having more extreme heat waves over a wider area. Uh, hurricanes, much more... you mentioned Sandy. Okay, hurricanes, there's more uh, uncertainty in the science of hurricanes. Are they because... increasing? It's a, it's a tricky thing, hurricanes. I mean, they have this graph of hurricanes by decade, and they, they don't show an increase. Right, so I didn't, I didn't say they did. But we're seeing more intense rainfall. That's very clear over the whole of the U.S., over Europe, and in, uh, and in, other, and in other places as well. And now, what's going on in the future, that's where we're concerned about. Because so what, we're what doing, can we do? What can, if, if well, we, well, what we're doing right now is not nothing. What we're doing right now is we're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide every year, year on year. What can we do about it? We, well, we like burning fossil fuels. No, it's you, 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 know, you know what? You like the product of burning fossil fuels. Like you mentioned before, earlier on, about how dirty the air was when there was unrestricted burning of coal. Right? We don't like actually burning coal. What we like is the energy that comes from coal. Right? What we like is energy. Yeah, and we like energy, and even if we cut our emissions in half, it right. wouldn't affect the world. Oh, it would. If, you cut your, if we cut our emissions by it would half... Be, it would be a tenth of the world's CO2. And well, we're not going to cut it in half. Well, eventually we will, because eventually this is going to be a problem that is so large that we will transition to a more but renewable... China market. isn't cutting, India isn't cutting. That's a big problem, and they're not going to take a lead on this because we haven't taken a lead But on why it. should we make poor people suffer? I don't see it. You shouldn't make poor people if suffer. If you make fuel costs more, that hurts poor people. Then you give it back as a rebate, and you make people understand that what we need to do is move off carbon sources of fuel. I'm not qualified to debate you climatologists. Why won't you debate Roy Spencer? He's not a flake. He, he helped produce the data that, that 
the government uses for the I'm, atmospheric temperatures. I'm, 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 not a, I'm not a politician. You know, I'm here because you asked me to come on and talk about the science, and I am totally happy to do that. And any time you want to ask me again, just give me a call, and I will come here, and I will tell you about the science, and I will point you in the right direction. But I'm not interested in doing this because it's good TV. I'm interested because what we have discovered as a scientific community uh, needs to be talked about. And you need to talk about it, and Roy needs to talk about it, and all these people need to talk about it. But I don't need to be arguing with people just to make good TV. Thank you, Gavin Schmidt. I appreciate you coming in. I would love to have you back. And if you would give the chair up again, let's bring Roy Spencer in to reply to what you said. Or stay if you like. I'm not interested. But thank you very much. Dr. Spencer, can you? So... What do you say to what he says? Well, Gavin said quite a bit. Uh, I agree with some of what he says. Um, I speak out because I believe that forcing unrealistic, expensive energy solutions upon the poor it, is going to kill people. We know that poverty kills. That's not theoretical. It happens today. I would rather save people today from poverty than theoretically save people in the future. You've also said that carbon dioxide can make the planet greener? Well, that's pretty well understood. There's hundreds of papers that have been published by plant physiologists that show that increasing CO2 is good for basically all the plants that they study, even crops like uh, corn. My long-term prediction is that eventually we're going to realize that more CO2 in the atmosphere is actually a good thing. And considering the fact that it is necessary for life on Earth to have CO2 in the atmosphere. It's amazing how little there is in the atmosphere. The perception among my friends here in New York is that you're this weird outlier. And all the other serious scientists say, man's doing it. We've got to fix it now. Well, I hate to say it, but that's you know, a, a characterization that's come, a, come about because of the media. I mean, people like Al Gore portray people like me as fringe, and when in fact... He, he I, won't debate anybody well, either. Well, no, of course not. I consider my views pretty mainstream, and uh, I know there's a in lot of... In climatology, you find a lot of people who I agree find with a you. lot of people that agree with me, but will not speak out because they're afraid that they might lose their funding. All you hear from on the other side from me are scientists who have decided to take a stand uh, publicly, uh, get involved with the politicians. And, and if you say this is a big problem, that's when you get money to oh, fix sure. the problem. Yeah, Congress doesn't give money out for things that are not problems. Thank you, Dr. Roy Spence. So, there you have it. Now let me give you a quick biography on Dr. Gavin Schmidt. He is working for NASA. So he, you know, he was named to head the... Uh, Goddard Institute for Space Studies um, in June 2014, and he is continuing on the work that James Hansen, a friend of Al Gore's, had done previously. Um, Schmidt is the third person to hold that position. So yes, his job actually is as a climate modeler and a climatologist. Well, what's his background? He has a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Jesus College in Oxford, the Corsham School, um, and a PhD in applied mathematics at the University College in London. So they have somebody heading this who doesn't even have an educational background in natural sciences or space studies. You have a mathematician. This guy may be a great modeler in certain things, but that's who you have running this. Is it a wonder why he does not want to debate or have a discussion with somebody who spent their entire career actually in those particular scientific fields? So I hope that sheds a little bit of context to what you've just seen. But speaking of NASA, does anybody remember Apollo 7 astronaut Walt Cunningham? He's, I believe, 82 years old now. But he is speaking out and has been for a while about this whole climate change hysteria. This is a guy who actually went to the moon. I think he knows what he's talking about. 
A legendary astronaut touched down in the Twin Cities tonight. Apollo 7 astronaut Walter Cunningham is here to bring his insight into the climate change debate. And just hours ago, he wrapped up a presentation at the University of Minnesota. Our Joe Mason sat down with Cunningham to discuss his current mission. On Apollo 7 in 1968, astronaut Walter Cunningham viewed the world from a perspective few ever will. Well, I felt very fortunate to do it. Still good, Booster? That's a firm flight. Now this 82-year-old who pioneered man's reach into space is on another mission. I've always had some concern about the environment. Models are not data. Cunningham spoke on the climate change debate at the University of Minnesota. I'm here to encourage everyone to go look at the data themselves, not just buy what they're told. He believes scientific climate models have failed to reflect global temperature trends. I find that my standards for science uh, are more important to me than anything else, and I hate to see them being depreciated by the alarmist claims today. Cunningham has been a longtime advocate against the theory. His involvement dates back to the 1970s when he helped found an environmental organization. Politics, the media, and what have you have allowed uh, us now to be facing one of the one of the biggest scientific hoaxes in history, really, is, is what's being pushed on. High top everything. Looks good. Ten days, 20 hours, eight minutes. That's how long Cunningham spent in space on Apollo 7. The career and the life I've led, the older I get, the more I appreciate it. An American pioneer who continues on a mission long after he returned home from outer space. Joe Mazin, 5 Eyewitness News. Cunningham's flight on Apollo 7 was the first American space flight to carry astronauts into orbit after a cabin fire killed three members of the Apollo 1 crew in 1967. A group of scientists issued a... So that was Walt Cunningham. I think the man has some credibility. I mean, the man spent a vast majority of his life dealing with space, dealing with flight. I've actually had conversations with, or a conversation with him uh, last year when he was in town when that video was filmed uh, regarding uh, flight weather and solar flares, sunspots, coronal mass ejections in the solar cycle. And the man knows what he's talking about. He really, really does. And I'll tell you, um, I would so love to be able to sit down, and, and, I, and I hope I can actually do this sometime, that I can sit down and really have a nice long conversation. And, and I missed that presentation last year, and I really do hope to be able to catch a, another presentation with uh, Walt Cunningham. Because believe me, I know that that little bit of time that he and I had a chance to talk really opened my eyes to things. And there's no doubt that I know that he's on the right path uh, with his assertions. But that being said, is there another cause of climate change slash global warming that we haven't really considered before? The answer might surprise you that while we've considered solar cycles, we've considered the uh, wobble of, of uh, planets going around the sun, we've considered man-made causes, maybe it just is. How has the Earth's warming and the Earth's climate change been in relation to other planets. Check this out. This might surprise you. Climate change, which is NASA's hottest secret. <laughs> now, we can look through and find the smoking gun of all 2012 scholarship because we can look at all the planets and the sun and see changes just like we see on Earth. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that. This is a composite graph of solar activity based on core samples from the Antarctic and the Arctic. And what you're seeing is the total amount of sunspot activity. This is what it's been doing in the last few years. We are now at a point where the only time that the solar activity was higher than it was right now, just so conveniently happens to be 11,000 years ago, which in ancient teaching is associated with what? What happened 11,000 years ago? Atlantis fell, right? Could that be related to the solar activity? Hell yeah. So we're now at the strongest point in 8,000 years since that happened. 
Mercury has grown a magnetic field when Messenger went by in 2008 that was not seen in the 70s with Mariner 10. That's a big change in Mercury. Venus has had a 2,500% increase in this green glow on the night side that you can see there. That's active oxygen. So the atmosphere of Venus is changing back into something that's breathable. Mars is growing clouds and ozone, as you can see right here. That, there were no clouds on Mars before. That's brand new. The polar ice caps are melting on Mars, and they're actually calling it global warming in the mainstream media. But there's no SUVs on Mars, not that I've ever seen. <laughs> Jupiter is having these white ovals that were disappearing between 97 and 2000, three of them, and then they all meld into one. And this scientist, Dr. Philip Marcus, believed it would cause Jupiter to warm by 18 degrees in only 10 years. Now, if that happened on Earth, what would happen to all life on Earth as we know it? Toast. It's toast. So there's a massive global warming going on with Jupiter. That was the prediction based on what would happen in 2000. That's about the time he did this prediction. He said 10 years. Look at what happens eight years later. Jupiter is having raging thunderstorms and global upheaval. Towering storms more than 100 kilometers tall. The rare storm is a sign of recent turmoil on the planet. And here's the picture. These bright hot spots were never seen before. This is extra heat that shouldn't be there. And the colors of the rings are changing. Then you go out to Saturn. You're seeing this plasma torus that's grown. All this red area wasn't there before. That's all this charged energy coming from the sun. Jupiter also has one around it, which I just didn't have time to show you in this presentation because we had to shorten it. You're seeing massive x-rays coming out from the near the equator of Saturn. That's also a new phenomenon. Again, you're seeing a hot spot just like the one I just showed you on Jupiter, the raging storms, the global upheaval in 2008. Same thing happened in 2004. Where the heck did all this energy come from? The planet just goes, this energy comes out. It's amazing. Uranus, as of 1986, looked like green pea soup with hardly any peas, just the green part. Nothing to see. It's just very flat. Now, this is false color, so that's why this is brighter than this. We're not so much concerned about the color. We're concerned about these little guys, because that's what we didn't see before. These are huge storms. Now, remember also, Voyager 2 swept by Uranus. So it saw the whole planet. It didn't just see the side that we see. So even with a satellite going past, we're now seeing all these storms that were not there before. And you're starting to see that happen. It was called featureless as a cue ball, but now Eric Karkoschka is saying, really big, big changes. Now this is more typical of uh, NASA, when NASA says, ground-based observations show seasonal brightness changes, not well understood. Oh, moving on. <laughs> they try to downplay this stuff. But this is interplanetary climate change. This is something that's happening to every planet. And all they do is they tell you that it's based on the tilt angle of the axis to the sun. The sun is heating it up because the pole is tilting or because the equator is tilting. And whatever the planet is doing, they just alter it for that planet and say, oh, well, it's got to be caused by the tilt angle of the planet relative to the center of the, uh, of the sun. Not so. Neptune, 1989, relatively few bright clouds. But between 96 and 2002, there's a 40% increase in brightness in the near-infrared range. This is very significant because, obviously, this could not be caused by anything we normally understand. And it's the same thing that's happening throughout the rest of the solar system. It's all doing the same stuff. What you're going to see now is a description, a visual description of how it's been changing. So check this out. You watch down here, you can start to see how it grows over just six years. So that's phenomenal. I mean, that's like turning on a lampshade and having light suddenly burst out of the planet that wasn't there before. The near-infrared range is not visible to the eye, but it's just above the visible level. So it's within the spectrum of what can be seen if you had the right eye to see it. So you can do that with a camera, you just can't do it with the naked eye. Now, Pluto is experiencing global warming, even though it's moving away from the sun. There's been a 300% increase in its overall atmospheric pressure. This whole system tells us that Earth changes are not unique to the Earth. They're happening everywhere in the solar system. But even on Earth, we're seeing things that are not attributable
to the ordinary climate change that we would think of as being caused by SUVs. Volcanic activity since 1875 has gone up by over 500%. Sea level is increasing. Temperature is increasing. Tornado activity is increasing. Natural disasters are increasing. The inflation-adjusted economic losses are increasing. Here you see the, the red indicates how much heat there is at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, on the floor of the ocean. And then what you're seeing is 85 and 96, or 99 rather. So in 14 years, you see a substantial warming on the bottom of the ocean. Now guess how the scientists explain this? Well, of course, the sun is warming the top of the ocean. And then those warm particles just start sinking down, 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 which is what they're going to do, right? And they sink to the bottom, and they warm up the bottom of the ocean. Oh, that's, that's got to be what it is. They warm up the bottom of the ocean, they sink down. So the next time you ever want to boil up some hot dogs, just get a hair dryer. It works great. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do it that way? You'd, you'd probably take three hours of boiling. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Heat rises. That's the first, one of the most basic laws of thermodynamics that we all know. But not here. Something's happening inside the Earth. So isn't that interesting? That global warming may actually encompass more than just the United States, and, uh, or actually the, uh, the Earth's globe. Um, I wanted to go back to Walt Cunningham for just a moment because I, before playing that clip, I had forgotten to pull up his biography and I just wanted to show real quick or just discuss real quick his educational background since I did that for the other person from NASA. Um, Walt Cunningham, former NASA astronaut, he received a Bachelor of Arts with Honors in Physics in 1960, a Master of Arts with Distinction in Physics in 1961, both from the University of California, Los Angeles. He had also completed a doctorate in physics with the exception of his thesis, uh, also from, the, from UCLA. He was working for Rand Corporation at the time, and then he went on to NASA and never did uh, finish his thesis. And then he also was part of the Advanced Management Program at Harvard Graduate School of Business, which he completed in 1974. And then he had worked with NASA's uh, Space Sciences and Geology Department with 2,000 hours between 1963 and 1971. You want to talk about somebody who is extremely well qualified to talk about this subject? This is your man. He knows the stuff inside and out. Probably knows it better than uh, Roy Spencer. Uh, definitely knows more about this than the climatologist uh, Gavin Schmidt. And certainly a whole lot more than Al Gore or Leonardo DiCaprio or any of these, or Ted Danson, Hillary Clinton, or any of these other people who have absolutely no basis in scientific research. Um, I've got my own thoughts and opinions. I've already expressed some of them on this show. Uh, but I also know that because I don't have a scientific background, but I have a historical background, that's my context. I look back for historical patterns, historical trends. Can we see how the process has repeated itself in cycles? Because things, things work in cycles, honestly. They really, really do. And as a historian, I try to look back in cycles throughout history. Because even though in, in, in the world of investing, the disclaimer is past performance is not indicative of future results, except when you're actually looking in things like history and you're seeing cause and effect relationships, that sometimes past performance is indicative of future results. And that is to actually look at what the data tells you, not necessarily what I think it should tell you. And that's kind of where we're at on this whole climate change and global warming debate. Uh, there's a lot more I don't know. There's a lot more that you don't know because there's a lot more that scientists don't know. And that's what we continue discussing this topic. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.